Hi everybody, Keith Tanner here from Fly Miata, and today we're going to talk about springs. Pretty exciting. In fact, we're going to talk about a very specific aspect of springs and suspension setup, and that is coil bind. Uh, coil bind is bad. We're going to explain why, what it is, what happens if you experience coil bind, how to avoid coil bind, etc. etc. Um, as always, please, um, if you have questions, throw them in the comments. Um, I'm a little scattered right now. I've been in training for something totally unrelated all day, so I've been five hours of database structures and things, so I may need your questions to help lead me along with what's going on here, so please bear with me. So, what is coil bind? Coil bind is what happens when a spring fully compresses and all of the coils come together and they bind up, and your spring, which is you know obviously bouncy and designed to, let's take a soft one, of designed to flex, no longer can because it's become a solid tube of metal. I can illustrate it most, caref most clearly with this. This is a little five pound per inch helper spring. You, know, you can see it easily moves back and forth until it goes into bind and it becomes a solid stack. And at that point, it's basically a solid piece of metal. That's coil bind. Now these springs are designed to go into coil bind. That's, that's part of their function. Uh, for your main spring, it's a problem. Um, yeah, I'll actually show you. Here's a couple of springs that have experienced coil bind on the car. And this is a good way to tell. One of the questions we had is, how can you tell if you're experiencing coil bind? Um, one way is it sounds as if big suspension movements are a metal-to-metal -metal hit instead of being, you know, an actual bang, because that's exactly what is going on. Um, and you can see here, let me get a pencil. Try this out if you can see this, but you see these little lines around here following on the edges of the, uh, the, edges of the coil? Not super clear. It's been a while since I did it on this one, but yeah, there's... You can see these lines right here. Those are the marks from the various coils as they come into contact with each other. If you have those marks, your, your spring has been coil binding. Um, coil binding is bad for a lot of reasons. If you do it enough, it'll start to sort of detemper the steel. The spring will start to sag, which will make it more likely to coil bind, which means it's a vicious circle. It'll just keep getting worse and worse and worse. So basically you are beating your springs to death if you do it. It also puts an extraordinary load on the spring perch. Because normally, you now your car is, is sitting, the weight of your car is sitting on these perches as the suspension moves up and down, no problem. Um, but the really heavy load when you fully bottom out is taken by the bump stop. The bump stop against the top of the shaft, the top of the shock. So you've got this, this big solid tube taking that load. If your spring coil binds and it goes solid before your bump stop is, in, is fully engaged, that means that all of the load, and it's always a hard shock load because there's nothing to absorb it anymore, goes right through the perch. And depending on the style of shock, um, Coney's can do this. Any shock that's got the perch attached on a circlet, for example, can rip the perch right off the shock. And then your suspension collapses and sadness. So obviously coil bind, there's nothing good about coil bind. Um, unless you're racing NASCAR, in which case I think they actually use coil bind as a suspension tuning tool to keep the car a half millimeter or probably NASCAR has a much more colorful term for it, off the deck. We are not driving NASCAR Miatas. We're going to avoid coil bind. We consider it bad because we're not setting up the NASCAR stuff. But yeah, their, their use of coil bind is really kind of interesting stuff. So, do you have any questions yet, Travis? Not yet. No, man. I'm doing well. I'm really hoping this question stay because it'll do so much better. So that's how we tell if we have coil bind. And the reason you get coil bind is, again, going back to, I should have a shock with no springs on it, but I don't. Um, no. What happens is basically you run out of travel in the shock before you run out of travel in the spring. Um, you know, you can see this this shock has it's got about four inches of travel before it gets into the bump stop. And so what we need is we need the ability for this spring to compress at least four inches before it runs out of movement. And yeah, um, you can actually look up on major spring manufacturers. They'll often list the the bind height, um, the available travel, the, the free length and everything. The IBOC uh, catalog does that, for example. You can look up, say, for this, this IBOC 800 250-300S. Um, you can look at it and say, okay, it weighs so much. It is so far, it's an 8-inch long spring. When it's compressed, it's such and such a length. It's such and such a, such and such a amount of travel available. So now we're going to look a little bit at how springs are constructed. Because that has some effect on when you're likely to coil bind. So, these two springs are the same length, as you can see, they're both 10-inch springs. They're both the same diameter, and diameter is always the inner diameter, not the outer. Hello. 
Um, but they are very different rates. This is a 375, this is a 600, so this one's almost twice as stiff. And you can see, like visibly right there, look at how thick those wires are. This one's coiled at a much thicker wire. And so now that's, you can, you can visibly see, well, it makes sense, this would be a stiffer spring, fair enough. But if that also means these springs are the same length, they got the same number of coils in them, there's less space available. So this spring has less available travel than this one does, simply because it's just got more metal in it. Now I'm gonna digress a little bit and talk about what a spring actually is. Um, you know, a coil spring is basically, it's like a sway bar. It's, it's like you took a straight piece of steel that's being twisted at each end, and you just coil it up in a bar, or in a, in a coil like this. So there's a bunch of different ways you can affect the spring rate. You can make it thicker material, you can change the number of coils in it, um, but what we're really interested in right now is what is the amount of available space to us. Now, if you don't have a nice handy iBoc catalog, uh, you know, mm -hmm. if you go to the ground control store, they're an iBoc reseller, you can download the catalog there. It's really interesting reading if you're a spring nerd. Um, <laughs> I think it's interesting. You can figure out roughly how much loop or short spring is easier, how much travel is available. And it's done with the very simple math that you think. You basically measure how much distance there is between the coils, going straight up and down. So our gap there is 9.7 millimeters. And we have one, two, three, and a bit. So three of those, we'll call it 10 millimeters, that's 30 millimeters plus whatever that is, two and a half. So this thing has approximately 32 millimeters of compression available between fully open and fully closed before it goes into coil bind. And I'm sure I could look this particular spring up in the, did I look this one up? Nope, I didn't. Um, in the catalog and it would tell me something, but that's close enough to figure it out. So if that number is smaller than the amount of travel available in your shock, you have a problem. And this is something that you can actually use as a rough indicator of how much travel a suspension might have available. Um, the rear shocks and the Fox suspension that we sell, we have to use long springs for that because we went to a lot of effort to maximize travel in those. Especially on the ND, for example, the rear shock has something like seven inches of, of shaft travel, maybe seven and a half. So obviously you cannot use an eight inch spring on that because you can't get seven inches of travel out of an eight inch spring. This thing. Um, so if you are looking at an aftermarket suspension and it comes with eight inch springs, Obviously it does not have as much potential travel as a suspension that has to use a 10 or 12 inch. I think we use a 12 inch on the back of those because we just need that travel. Um, I have to double check that. Anyhow, so it's a, it's a good way to sort of double check. There have been some suspensions. We had a, a vendor come to us and say, hey, check out our ND suspension. We think it's gonna be awesome. And we, I just looked at the spring settings, the spring um, specifications. So there's no way you guys are giving up at least three inches of travel. Right now I'm not interested because you haven't done your, you're not bothering very hard. Anyway, we have a question there, Travis? We have one. Okay. And it's a little off topic, but he wants to know what our opinion is on coilover conversion kits, specifically for conies. Okay. The question is, what's our opinion on coilover conversion kits, specifically on conies? Let me grab one. I'll be right back. Yes, this is the sort of stuff I have sitting around in my own garage. This is the sort of thing he's talking about. It's a sleeve that goes over an existing shock and converts a fixed perch into, a, uh, into an adjustable perch. Implementation quality varies. Um, some of them, the Tokiko implementations, it sits on top of the perch, doesn't sit well. The, the Tokikos were not designed for that. Um, the old KYB AGX, you can knock the perch off. The Kony sits with a, um, has a, has a, Sir clip on there so it clips in. So it comes down to the type of shock and how it's how it's purchased mounted in the first place. Um, they're a good way to convert a regular spring into effect, a regular shock into effectively a coilover, um, but they can cause some problems because you're limited, depending on how this mounts, you may be limited in terms of how long a spring you can run. Going back to the little Takiko Illuminas, uh, we could only run a five and a half inch spring in the front um, because of how it mounted on there. A very, very short spring. Real potential for, uh, for coil binding that. So, um, yeah, I will mention one other thing. And you see these a lot on coilovers. Um, not so much on, on some others, but you see this very lightweight spring here. I've heard them called helper springs. I've heard them called, uh, what, keepers, I think. And I've seen them defined as very, very different. I call them secondaries because that one is the clearest, most consistent one I've seen. But basically the purpose of this 
is there's two ways you can use it. In this case, it's being used just, there's a bunch of adapters in here. It's just being used to keep everything in place when the shock is fully extended. And as soon as you start to move the shock, it goes into full bind. And effectively at that point, it's a spacer. So now when we're looking to calculate our amount of spring travel, we need to take into account of what our available travel is here versus how much this shock, or this spring can compress now. So that's what that is. Sometimes you'll see them with a stiffer rate. We do this in our Vmaxes. This is a stiffer rate. You can see how thick those coils are. And in this case, it's meant to be more of a functional part of the, uh, of the suspension. You actually end up more with like a dual rate suspension. Uh, once the main spring is fully extended, this one kicks over and adds a little bit more weight onto the, uh, onto the wheel. Um, I kind of prefer these. They're fairly, they can be quite a bit more expensive, which is one of the reasons why you don't see them on the Foxes. Now, flying Miata springs, and depending on the application, this varies. This particular one is for the rear of an NA, um, has effectively a built-in helper spring. And that's what these closed coils are here. They're designed to go into bind early, um, and, and it effectively gives us a way to make a spring a little bit longer without affecting the ride height. Um, so these particular coils, these, these close coils at the top here, are designed to go into bind. And this is effectively a single piece. It's not a progressive rate, not really. It's a single piece um, spring that has two distinct spring rates in it. A progressive rate would be wound more gradually. And the idea being that as the various coils go into bind, the amount of uh, pressure it takes and the amount of load it takes to compress the spring will go up. And so your spring rate increases as you get closer to the end of travel of the spring. Um, I'm just kind of rambling on about springs here, man. Uh, the disadvantage to progressive rate springs, it sounds like a great idea. The disadvantage is that it can be difficult to tune your shocks for them because the spring rate is always different um, depending on where you are in the travel. And it can be difficult to set up your handling well because you know if you hit a bump and all of a sudden your spring rate jumps up by 30% on one corner, then uh, your weight transfer changes, things get exciting. So for ride, they can kind of work out. For performance applications, they can be difficult to deal with. Any more questions over there, Travis? Not yet. Okay. Doo -doo -doo. How much should a daily drip, I'm looking at the questions you guys sent in here because I have lost my, I have lost my train of thought. Um, how much should a daily driven and spiritually driven NA Miata worry about this? My opinion is there is always a bump big enough. If your suspension can go into coil bind, it will go into coil bind eventually. And as I said, it will start to eventually degrade the springs. It will become more and more common, and you will either end up with a car that is down low in its, uh, low in its ride height, hitting the bumps off all the time, hopefully, or not, or just coil binding, possibly ripping the purchase off. There's nothing good about it. So this is something that it doesn't happen with time. It doesn't, you know, cars don't degrade into coil bind. It's a geometry problem right from the start. So how can we affect it? What happens? If we have, and I don't think I have a, a guaranteed coil bind shock here, but say if I had set up this fox with this little guy, you can see it's pretty easily going to go into coil bind. Look at how much, look at how much um, travel there is there. What happens if I am getting into coil bind? How do I deal with it? Well, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. And the basic thing is you just need to make sure that the spring is not fully compressed before the shock is fully compressed. You can move the perch down. That will effectively lower your ride height. Um, but it will mean that the shock will bottom out earlier relative to where the spring is. Um, so that's one solution. Another solution is to go with a longer spring. And I'll show you, I'll get into more spring design theory, stuff everywhere. These two springs, those are both 300s. As you can see, one is an inch longer than the other. One's a seven inch, one's an eight inch. But if you look at them, they've got the same thickness of coil and the same number of turns. So the actual spring, if you unwound it, the actual spring would look very much the same. Um, same amount of material in it. So this one, therefore, has bigger gaps in between the springs. And so generally speaking, all else being equal, a longer spring will have more travel available than a short spring. So that's one of our solutions. If you have a problem with your spring running out of travel because it simply, you know, it doesn't have enough travel to deal with the shock, then you put in a longer spring. If you want to keep your ride height, you move the perch down by the same amount. Because this will compress the same, you know, we put a Miata on it. If the spring compresses three inches, the spring will compress three inches. So you just move the perch down by an inch, your right head's the same, and there you go. There can be packaging problems with that. There's drive shafts run by shocks. There's upper control arms by shocks. You may not be able to go any lower. But if you, you may not have a, a, enough adjustment. If you can lower the perch effectively, and by that I mean relative to this point here, 
Um, yeah. Uh, actually, it's relative to here, isn't it? Um, if you can lower the perch by an inch, then you can run a spring that's an inch longer. So you really want to run about as long a spring as you can package. The downsides get into, like I said, there can be clearance problems. They do weigh a little bit more. Um, and in extreme cases, you know, if it's 12 inches and longer, you can get into the point where the springs start bowing sideways if they're soft, if they're soft enough. Miatas don't really get into that point with anything. Travis, we have a question. Yes, does it make any difference if you run the helper spring at the top or the bottom? Does it make any difference if the helper spring is at the top or the bottom? And functionally, the answer is no. It doesn't really make any difference. Um, if there are concerns about the helper spring sitting a little bit sideways, which can happen, uh, especially on ones you know built more to a budget, uh, you may end up with a where the helper spring fully compressed. If it's just not completely level, sometimes it's better to have that at the top. Otherwise, it can push your mainspring sideways a little bit, and you get into rubbing situations. Um, but fundamentally, in terms of function, it doesn't matter. It's the same thing. Now, one thing I want to make clear. Make sure my questions are still up here. There we go. One thing I want to make clear, when I'm talking about moving the perch, I am not talking about adjusting the preload. There's a lot of people who equate moving perches with preload. That's like equating headlight aim with rake. You know, if you change the rake to your car, you raise, you raise the back of the car, your headlight aim will change, but you're not really changing the headlight aim. It has no effect on what you're doing. Same thing with preload. When you move this perch up and down, you are effectively changing the preload, but the preload is a result of that change. You are not tuning the preload. I have very strong feelings about some of the marketing crap that's out there about preload and being a tuning tool. It's not the thing. Um, it's basically people making changes to preload that are affecting other aspects of the shock's geometry. That's what's making the difference. And they're saying it's the preload, but it's not. So moving the perch up and down this thing, yes, it changes the preload. Does that have any other effect other than the fact that your perch is now higher or lower? It does not. So if you have a double adjust, er, adjustable length body like this, and you adjust the preload, you can do something like lower the perch down and then shorten the whole shock up. What you're basically doing is you're get, taking away some of your suspension travel. Um, so what you're really doing is you're decreasing this amount uh, to make sure you run out of suspension travel before you run out of spring travel. You're not really affecting your preload or, or cutting on your bump, your, um, your bottoming up because of that. Travis, we have a question. You'll like this one. So compared to the suspension systems that we sell, where does the Spec Miata Penske kit fit in terms of suitable use scenarios? And are there any comments on the bump stop design slash use? Okay, question about the Penske Spec Miata setup and how it compares to our stuff. Well, first off, our stuff is not legal in Spec Miata. So therefore, if you are racing Spec Miata, you have to run the Penske, whether you like it or not. The same way you used to have to run an off the shelf Bilstein. Um, so there's that. Uh, I have not looked carefully into their bump stop choices. Um, they run very high front spring rates, uh, very relatively low rear spring rates. I think it's a 700, 350 or 700, 325, something like that. It's a lot less rear spring rate than we would usually run. But again, they run it because they have to. Um, and as for the bump stops, they're probably a lot closer running on the bump stops all the time, like a classic mini. Uh, but I certainly know they are not looking to coil bind. So, <laughs> um, because that would be basically a solid suspension, no wheel movement. You would not be able to absorb any bumps. Uh, you would have very little lateral grip and eventually you'd probably break something. So regardless of what their bump stop design choice is, which again, I'm not familiar enough with that particular setup to say what their bump stops are, um, they are still trying to avoid coil bind. And that is the subject for today. Uh, do you have another question there, Travis? Not yet. Okay. So yeah, ways to, uh, ways to deal with coil bind. And that is basically get a spring with more travel, which usually means longer. Um, if you can package it. It is possible, to, depending on how you design springs, I mean, that's a 300 pound spring, just like that. Look at how much thinner it is, because there's so much less material in there, it's able to get away, it's basically a shorter little torsion bar. Um, it ends up being quite a bit stiffer. So you, it is possible if you have access to the right coil thicknesses, that kind of thing, to make a very long travel spring. This is gonna be much more liable to bow sideways. It doesn't matter because it's only this long. That is the secondary spring I ran a dual spring setup on, on my AFCOs for a while there, which was really interesting. I could nerd on about that for a while. Um, the fact that you've never seen it in the Climbing Out of Catalog will tell you something right there, but it was really kind of interesting to play with. That's more of an off-road thing. Uh, so yeah, if you can, you go with a longer spring, you go with a spring that basically has more travel available to it, or you have to change your ride height 
um, lower your ride height basically or decrease your bump travel one or the other basically the same thing um, in order to get there now one thing to note again we looked at this briefly this stiffer spring has a lot less travel available than a soft spring but it's not going to compress as much when the, when the car is sitting on it so this one will probably have a perch higher so this one is more likely to be um, to run into coil blind problems because it's soft. Now I have some numbers here. Let's look at some of these numbers here. Uh, so for an eight inch spring, which would be these guys. So for these two dudes, one's a 300, one's a three, 225. Um, from the iBot catalog, a 300 inch, a 300 pound spring, this one right here, uh, has five inches of travel, 5.04 inches of travel, and is carrying 1,513 pounds at that point. A 450 pounder, which I, I know I've got kicking around here, it might actually be this, um, has four and a quarter inches of travel, but it'll be carrying 2,100 pounds. So it has a quarter inch less travel available, but it's gonna have a higher load by the time you get there. So it takes basically a bigger hit to eat it up, all else being equal. Um, the 600 pound version, which I don't think I have a 600 pounder here, but you get the idea. Um, is down to 4.4 inches of travel, but 2,600 pounds of load. So basically, the stiffer the spring, the less available travel it has, um, but the more load it will take. Basically, the, the more force it will take to get to that point. If we look at, say, a given rate of spring, a 450, I had these all noise and organized. I was sort of moving stuff around and playing a shell game. So say we look at a, yeah, a certain rate. This is a 300, this is a 300, this is a 300. Um, the six inch version of a 450 pound spring has 3.6 inches of travel. The seven inch has 4.2 and the eight inch has 4.72. So you can see that you're gaining quite a bit of travel. By going two inches longer, you gain over an inch of available travel in the spring. So that's why going with a longer spring will help quite a bit. And it takes considerably more load again to fully compress them. Um, which is, there's all sorts of interesting stuff going on here. But that's an important thing to know is if you are, if you are bottoming out and it's more likely to happen with soft springs. Um, if you are, if you are coil binding these things, then you have to go with a longer spring or apparently stiffer ones. Um, again, I apologize guys. I'm usually more focused on this as usual. I'm flying without a net here and my brain is just in the wrong place to start off with. So please hit up with questions because it'll help a lot. Travis, we have a question. What's the best spring rates for a lower daily driver? What is the best spring rate for a lower daily driver? And the answer to that is enough to keep you off the bump stops as much as possible. Uh, if you want a very specific number, you haven't said how much lowered, you haven't said what your Miata, you haven't even said it's a Miata. I don't know, could be 300, could be 1,000. Um, <laughs> the best spring rate is one that keeps you off the bump stops as much as possible. Because as soon as you're on the bump stops, you effectively don't have a spring anymore. You have a little rubber hockey puck that you're bouncing up and down. And they are good for the end of your travel, but they shouldn't be your primary um, travel. The little classic mini that Travis is standing beside runs on effectively bump stops full time. Um, it doesn't really have springs. It just has bump stops. And uh, you wouldn't want that ride quality yet. Let me tell you that. I don't care how cool you think you are. You're bouncing all over the place. And it's actually coil conversions are very common for those little guys. If you want performance, that's one of the things you do is you give it a real spring. So I know that's not the exact answer you're looking for, but that's why flying Miata springs tend to be stiffer than most other lowering springs on the market. Um, because our goal is if you're going to drop the car by an inch, you're going to give up an inch of bump travel. Um, well, it's actually more, it's actually different. The jump is a little bit different. Say you, you, you shorten this assembly by an inch, you give up an inch of bump travel, you need a stiffer spring to keep yourself off that bump stop. So you cannot lower a car by an inch or two inches and just increase the spring rates by 15, 30%. It's not gonna be enough. You've gotta have a pretty significant spring rate increase, close to double, if you're getting rid of a significant amount of your suspension travel. It was a 91 Miata, if it makes a difference. It was a 1991 Miata. Okay, well, thank you for that. It was a 1991 Miata. So the correct spring rate for that is a set of flat Miata springs, uh, which is 300 odd in the front, 220 something in the rear. Check our website, that's what I do these days. My, my brain is full. Um, but yeah, the important thing is you've got to have enough spring rate. If you go too soft in the spring rate, you can run into problems with coil line, or you can run into problems with basically living your life on the bump stops. And that is, that's just not cool. You know, a rough ride might feel sporty, 
but your wheels are having, you know, if your butt's having trouble staying on the seat, your wheels are having trouble staying on the road, your tires. So yeah, compliance is good. Um, what is the maximum travel the Miata suspension geometry will tolerate? That's one of the questions we got on there. And you may have seen, if you've been following our website over the years, one of the first things we do when we are starting development of a new platform, when the ND came out, for example, when the NC came out, we've done it with these things multiple times, is we take the springs off and, uh, and we fully compress the suspension and find out where the limits are. You know, in the rear of an NA, the control arms hit the subframe, for example, that is the limit. Uh, in the front of an N NA, it's often the tire hitting the bottom of the, the fender sheet metal, not the actual fender itself, but the wheel opening. Um, that sort of thing happens on the NA. The NDs are really interesting because you can tell that they had all sorts of 3D modeling software in there, and so everything runs out of travel at the same time. You know, the, the sway bar end link runs out of travel, the control arm hits this, the sway bar hits that. So you can tell that there's like this point where everything goes wrong all at once. Um, so that is the maximum travel. So we start with that, and then we work backwards. Okay, we make sure we keep that, and then we work how much how much shock can we package in there? How long a shaft can we get in that thing? Um, you know, when I if you go back to my cheap coilover um, my cheap coilover video I did a while back, uh, that was one of the problems we had with these two piece coilovers is that they just couldn't package enough shaft travel to be able to give you actual bump travel in the rear and actually have any sort of droop available to you. It was very limiting, unfortunately. This is the front that had a different problem. Um, so yeah, maximum travel available depends on the generation of the car, but it is a fun thing to get pictures of, um, is to completely compress the travel and take a picture because people get all excited. In the NA, actually, you can get to the point where you just about put the differential on the ground. Um, I have skid marks, I have skid plates on my differential for this car and there are, it's bent, the skid plate is bent underneath the differential because you can, with enough travel, lay the diff into the ground. It's kind of, makes a lot of noise. Oh, so we have a question. Okay, this is a little specific. Very specific question. I have FM VMAX Classics on his 99 Miata. The perches are maxed out to the edge of the threads and it's still in the weeds at 205.50 on 15 by eight um, rubber liners. Do you have a longer spring to run closer to the factory ride height? Okay, that was a very specific question, and it's basically it's an NB with some VMAX Classics, and he says he's got the springs, he's got the perches all the way to the top, and he's got an unspecified ride height that he's unhappy with, he wants to be higher. Um, now, first off, we've done several generations, there's been a couple of different generations of those, we did extend the rear springs, um, they now run a 185 millimeter spring, they originally ran, I think, 160, we did go with a longer spring in the back to get people that higher ride height. And you have to watch out, the VMAX is a suspension that if you run it all the way up, you can put yourself into coil bind. Um, and that will lead to the springs losing their temper and gradually decreasing in ride height, which makes it worse. So you put the perches up higher until you get to the point where basically you're just hammering those poor little springs to death all the time. So in this particular situation, I would strongly recommend you have a look at the primary springs. Not these little guys, they're designed to be in bind. But have a look at the primary spring and see if you can see those telltale lines. Um, if you can, we do offer replacement springs for those things. Um, depending on how old this kit is, it may not have the 185 millimeter springs. We, most of the lifetime of that product, we've offered those springs. Um, it could be that the springs have, have sagged and fatigued. If you take them out, they should be, this is one way to spot a fatigue spring, is check to see what, how long it is compared to its free length. Um, make sure its free length is in where it's supposed to be. For example, this is a 10 inch spring. So if I measure this, it should be within a couple of percent of 10 inches exactly. If it is sagged, any real amount, I think AFCO says more than 5%, um, then the spring effectively is failing and it should be replaced. Um, yeah, that's one of the things AFCO is very, prompt, very proud about with their springs, because yellow ones are AFCO springs, uh, was their, their resistance basically that, and they had a warranty on, uh, on the length of that. Good quality springs shouldn't have that problem. The VMAX being more of a budget-oriented solution, metallurgy on the springs is not quite as good as it is on the iBox, I will admit that. They don't cost as much as our box springs either. Funny how that works. Um, and if you coil bind them, they will suffer much very quickly. So don't let them coil bind. So hopefully that answers this particular um, guy's problem or gal. Don't judge. Um, but yeah, definitely in that particular situation, if you're if you've got the perch up all the way, you've run out of adjustment, still too low. Check to make sure that your springs have not sagged. Uh, make sure you're not coil binding because coil binding will just make it worse. A lot of talking. Travis, we have more questions. We have two questions. They're both a little like off topic. We have a sway bar question and we have a preload question. Do you want one, both, or? Sway bar question. 
if it applies, I guess we can we can cover it. Let's let's hit the preload first though. Is the preload adjustment to control rebound travel when hitting a bump or on the road? I'm new to coilovers, just got the raceland coilovers. They keep scrolling, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to hear about your racelands, but um, again, you're never really adjusting preload. What you're adjusting, and I did a complete video on this, if you want to go look it up, it's on our, it's on our channel. channel. Um, I can take this apart without exploding, not oh, good. You're not really adjusting preload. What you are adjusting is you're adjusting your available shock travel. So, this is the front shock. And you can see it is set up, it is shorter than this one. Um, but they are set up, I believe, and this is this should be the way set up. They're set up so that the uh, they have the same amount of travel. So what you're really doing is you're adjusting the amount of bump travel available. And there's one only one answer for that, and that answer is as much as possible. So what you want to do, and usually with a two-piecer like this, let me soften this up. You want to set it up so that when it's fully compressed like this. The tire is as far, you know, you're just about the limits of the suspension. Like I said, in the rear, it could be the way the control arm hits the subframe. In the front, it's the tire going into the, the wheel well. That is your correct short length. And then the rest of it is what it is. You know, you cannot adjust. If you, if you lengthen this anymore, you're going to end up giving up your bump travel in order to get your ride height back. Um, if you make it any shorter, you're going to put other suspension components into places they don't belong, such as pieces of metal, or you're gonna put fenders in, or wheels into places they don't belong, such as fenders. So the correct length for a shock basically is the one that gives you maximum travel in a Miata. We're not talking about off-roaders here. If you were talking about building a rock crawler Jeep, I'd tell you something different, but we're not building rock crawlers. Um, so the, you're not adjusting preload. What you're doing is you're adjusting that shock length to be the correct length and then you're adjusting the perch height up and down to get you the ride height you're looking for. As you adjust the shock length, the preload on the, sh on the spring will change. And so that's why a lot of people think that the preload is the thing they're changing, but it's not. Again, it's like the headlight aim changing if you change the, ra the rake of your car. You're not really adjusting your headlight aim when you're adjusting your rake. You're adjusting your rake and your headlight aim is just a thing that's happening. Same with preload, think of it that way. It's a, it's a side effect. It's not the thing you're adjusting. Um, so yeah, you can see this one, if I have this set, well, this is set up for the same droop, same amount of droop, I think. Yeah, I think so. I forget where I had this one set up when I was playing around with it. But there's simply, if we had these set up to be the same length and they're fully compressed, I can't do it because the Fox has a spring on it, um, you would find there would be less travel overall because this thing, because of its packaging, it just can't fit as much shaft in the body because the body on this thing only goes down to here, whereas the shaft on the, on the Fox can go all the way to the bottom. It's more obvious in the rear than in the front. The front you actually have a little bit of room to play with. Um, you know, there's two and a half inches of empty, unused shock in the front of an MD and NC, but in the back you all you always use all of the shock available. That was a little bit of a ramble one. Um, I hope it answered the question. But again, you're not adjusting preload. Don't think about adjusting preload. Every time someone says, "Well, I increase the preload or decrease the preload and things got better," what they were really doing is they're increasing the amount of travel here. Preload changes the side effect. But this is what was really being adjusting. This is what was really doing the work was, was where this sits. Hopefully that answered that question. Um, I know it's not the way it's shown in the advertising. And I know there's certain forums that haven't really figured this out yet. And there's certain shock vendors that haven't figured it out yet. But again, preload is not your primary thing you're changing. It's just a thing that changes as a result of fixing other problems. So what was our sway bar question, Travis? Uh, someone wants to know, is it better to have stiffer sways with lighter springs or stiffer springs with lighter sways? And why not run the car without sways for the maximum independence of your suspension? Haha. -ha. So the question is sway bars versus spring. Um, should you run a lot of spring and very little sway bar or should you run very, a lot of sway bar and very little spring? And should you just run with no sway bars at all in order to give yourself complete independence of each side of the car? And these are, these are schools of thought. Um, you know, the, the big bar soft spring versus the big spring soft bar uh, camp, there are benefits to both. The one thing a sway bar can do that springs cannot, and I did a whole thing on the theory, theory of sway bars, so there's another video for you, you guys have lots of homework tonight, um, is that it, uh, it separates roll stiffness from 
bump stiffness, basically. So if I got rid of my sway bars and I wanted to keep the same overall roll stiffness, I'd have to run great big honking springs, which has a bunch of other side effects in terms of the ride quality, in terms of the ability, you know, you need the shock to keep that thing on the ground. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a problem. If I ran soft springs with great big bars, the car would have a hard time. It would follow the angle, follow the road quite a bit more side to side, you more head toss as the term it goes. Um, and you wouldn't necessarily have the resistance to say dive and, and, uh, and squat that you would with thicker springs. So the real answer is you do need both. There's a reason they have both. There's a reason that pretty much every production car in the world runs both. Um, some might only have, you know, only on one end, say a front wheel drive car with a lot of front bias will not have a rear sway bar. Um, you know, my little Honda CRX is like that. Um, my Vanagon, I think, is like that too. Go figure. Um, but in the Miata world, really, you need a combination of both. Whether you go with a really big bar and softer springs or very soft bars and slightly bigger springs, it's all just a matter of the gray area in the middle. It's never, every once in a while, someone thinks sway bars are bad, they take them off, they find out that the cars, you know, they've had to run very soft, very stiff springs to keep it off the bump stops, um, to keep it from rolling over in corners, and it doesn't really work out. But that's, the sway bar gives you the ability to decouple roll stiffness from bump stiffness, and that's an important thing to do. But it can't do everything, so the correct answer is it is in the middle of the road somewhere. Much like so much in life, the compromise is the best solution. Um, so here's a question, where to go? What causes the coil bind issue with last generation FM springs and rear top hats, and how is it addressed with the, with the revised springs? This is something, it's funny, we sold these springs for years, and then for some reason we started getting occasional reports of coil bind of purchase coming off. And this is effectively, I don't have one of the older ones here with me. Um, the, other, the previous generation had more tight coils in the end, which was great when these springs were originally designed, they were used with stock upper mounts, and that worked just fine. When we introduced our, our extended upper mounts, very nice um, handling and ride quality improvement for the NA Miata because it keeps you from hitting the bump stop so much, um, we were effectively moving, increasing the amount of bump travel. And you know when you get in the coil bind, when you've got more bump travel, than you do spring travel. And it got into very edge conditions, it was right on the edge of coil binding the spring. And, uh, and we had a couple of situations where it did coil bind springs. When they were being used with conies, it started to rip the conies perches off. When they were being used with Tsukiko, nobody noticed because the perch was stayed on. Um, and so basically what we had to do is revisit the spring design to give it a little more travel before it coil binded. And what we did was effectively change the way it's wound. I, I don't remember the exact details on exactly, but you can tell by looking, you can see the old ones have more coils up here, more dead coils. This one, I think what they did is they stretched the dead coils out a little bit more so they, they don't fully engage until a little bit later. It's effectively like running a slightly stiffer helper. Um, but that's, that's what we did, is we just tweaked the geometry a little bit so that it had more travel before it coil binds. If you didn't have upper mounts, you'd never notice. If you ran the conies with the, on the lower perch, which we don't actually recommend, but if you did that, you wouldn't have a problem because again, you'd be taking away some of that bump travel. It's only for the guys who were running right on the edge, who were running you know, as much, much bump travel as possible. They were running out of uh, spring travel before they ran out of spring shock travel and purchase came off. So there you go. It was interesting, it was so many years before we had to make that change. Um, it was at least half a decade. But hey, that's why you can't just put out a product and leave it out there, can you? You gotta keep looking at them, gotta keep working on them. Uh, da, da, da. Why do my coil or coilers hit my axles? And I believe that's coilover. I mentioned this. This is a front shock, but pretend it's a rear. On the on most Miatas, the uh, the half shaft, the rear drive shaft goes goes quite close to the shock. And depending on the geometry of what's going on, this can get quite close to it. If you're running a long spring, um, if you're running a very soft spring, or sorry, very pretty stiff spring so that you want the perch low to get the right height you're after, you can get into a problem where the, uh, where the shaft gets very close to the perch. On the conies, we actually worked around that by offsetting the bottom of the shock, so we just moved the shock over a little bit. That's why the um, conies, have, or V-maxes, sorry, have a left and a right for the rear to give that little bit extra room. Um, the solution to that is you've got to get that perch up. 
uh, or you got to move the shock sideways if you have that capability, but um, you need to get the perch higher. And the solution for that is you either need to raise your right height or you need to run a shorter spring, but not so short that you get coil bind. Um, or maybe you run a stiffer spring, which actually puts the perch higher up for the same right height. Sorry, a softer spring. Yeah, softer spring, which puts the perch higher up for the same right height. You know, you have to change around something like that, but that is unfortunately the way you have to do it. Uh, if you are dealing with something like this, you may have to lengthen the body. You may have to give up some of your compression travel um, in order to be able to do that. But uh, but the effect is you just you got to get that perch up. Yeah, lengthen the body. Um, I don't think that would work. Actually, lengthening the body. Yeah, it wouldn't. Uh, okay. Do we have any more questions? Well, for the for a latecomer, would you mind showing the coil bind example on the little spring again? Coil bind example, little spring. Sure, no problem. And I'll show it on this too, actually. But I'll show it first on little spring. These are all various helper springs at different rates. I don't know what the rates are offhand. This is a twenty kilogram per centimeter. Um, that's a five pounder. This one, woof. It's more like fifty. Stuff and gas. Anyhow, this is a spring that is still active, still in full movement, and then coil bind looks like this. It is basically when all the coils are touching each other, there's no space between the coils, this cannot be compressed any further. Now this is this being a helper spring or secondary spring, tender spring, um, is designed to do that. That's why it's flat on the side instead of having coils, and I say round coils. Um, so this is this is intended use, but that is what coil bind looks like. If I had a very big apparatus for putting a lot of a lot of um, force into a spring, I could show you with one of these things, but it would probably launch off the side and kill them. So, uh, and here's what it looks like in actual action. You can see this, this the, the gap here, this thing's live. As soon as you put any sort of load on this thing, there you go, it's solid. And now it's basically just a spacer. So that thing is in bind, it's intended to be in bind, and this one does all the work. And then when this one's fully extended, that little guy extends as well. Depending on the relationship and spring rate between these two, this one might start extending before this one is fully fully extended. Uh, the Vmaxes, I believe, will do that. When I was running that weird 300 pound secondary spring with 450s like this, um, it did act quite a bit differently, but that was an oddball setup. The idea was to give a soft, and almost a comp uh, progressive setup, a very soft initial hit, and the softer spring, this is when the car was being developed as a rally car. Uh, what happened was it was very hard to damp um, because you were either running at 300 pounds or you're running at 500 or whatever it was running at the time. Um, this was very hard to damp it. Really the correct way to do that is to have this lock out at a certain ride height, at your, at your stock ride height. I didn't have that particular part with me. It's an off-road thing, but it was kind of fun. I had it at Laguna Seca actually. Loads of, of body roll, very, very smooth plus ride, relatively speaking, over little bumps, um, you know, my little crazy back roads here, rally, my rally simulation roads. It felt really good until you got the big hits, and all of a sudden there was a big change in its behavior. Interesting experiment, kind of fun, interesting. But again, like I said, it did not make it into production, into the Find Me Out of Catalog, for a reason. Uh, do you have any more questions there, Travis? No, sir. Okay. I apologize, folks, today this was a little less focused than usual. Like I said, I've been, my, my, I did not have a chance to fully get my brain into gear before this, uh, so I apologize for that. If you do have any questions uh, based on what I've talked about, if you ask why the heck I have one of these things here, um, please do put them in the comments. We will answer them in the comments. Obviously, can't answer them live because, well, you know, don't have that technology yet. Um, hopefully, this has helped. Doesn't confuse anybody too much in terms of what coil bind is and why you want to avoid it. Uh, short version is it's bad, and you want to avoid it because you can collapse your suspension, wear your springs out early. Um, break your teeth, uh, Yeah, your, your significant other may never want to ride with you again because your car rides so badly. There's all sorts of bad things about coil line. So avoid it. Longer springs, springs with more space, whatever it takes. So that's it for today. Thank you for your attention, folks. We've got some pretty interesting stuff coming up tomorrow or next week. You're gonna to wanna to watch next week's video. I guarantee that one. Uh, it won't be me, so don't worry about that. Um, but we have some pretty sexy new product to show off of that one. So I'm looking forward to seeing everyone's reaction. In the meantime, uh, stay safe, and we will see you soon. Again, this is Keith Tanner from Flying Miata. Thank you very much for watching.